Welcome back, everybody, to the Hearthstone Global Games, and now I'm joined on the desk by Mr. Falcone himself. Absolute pleasure to be alongside you. I cast myself back a year ago when we cast on your Twitch channel, so it's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. How did you feel like that series went? I mean, that was a, a very tight affair that went really down to the wire. It was a nail-biter. Mm. I've got to say that. Um, we discussed this at length yesterday, uh, Neil and I, but I am a huge fan of all of the various priest decks, so I particularly liked the priest from Kazakhstan. Um, but yeah, those last few games, the fact that we had uh, Indiran versus Nyman twice in a row, right at the end there, fighting tooth and nail, awesome stuff. Yeah, a very... Uh... Amazing match, but now we move on to Spain versus Argentina. PNC Snail now guiding and Ilda's Ildemir. I believe PNC actually isn't playing today, so Nalgadin will be playing twice in his place on the side of Spain. We have Duck, Felink, Evangeline, and Josemi. Uh, I think I've got them just about right, some of the pronunciations. Evangelion. Right. Evangelion. Evangelion. Okay, that sounds a little bit nicer, but yeah, PNC not being included uh, with Argentina, and he, of course, is the anchor. So do you think that is a uh, is that going to be a tough for Argentina, losing their anchor? Uh, it is a big deal. I mean, for a variety of reasons. Not even based on the fact that he's the anchor, but it's three against four. Mm. Uh, we've had loads of Twitch chat memeing at us saying, oh, no, it's four against one because there's one person on, on screen. Obviously, that's never been the case. But now it really is the case that one team is at a disadvantage. That being said, some players have said that it would be easier with three players because less voices... Uh, you know, less less chefs to uh, not spoil the... I completely butchered yeah. that. You don't want to spoil the broth. I mean, that's what they said. But, Too uh, many chefs spoil the broth. There we, there go. we go. We got there eventually. We got there in the end. <laughs> but I mean, now Godin himself, he was top 64 in the Winter American Championships, so he's definitely got some accolades to work with. Also, came third in the No Mustache Cup. Now, I don't really know what the No Mustache Cup is. I probably wouldn't be allowed to compete in it. No, I would be allowed to keep compete in it, but you... Wouldn't be allowed. I definitely would not be allowed to compete in that one. Uh, I do have his lineup from that tournament noted down, and you know when that when when it's time, we'll we'll bring that up. Uh, and here we go. So now Gaiden going to come up first versus Feeling. Yeah. So he's going to be playing first and third, but Snail will be the one who's going to be playing the ace match. Now with no oh man, this is this is a dream come true. Look at the ace match. We've got the Snail and the Duck. <laughs> the, Could this have been the better? The face off of the Snail and the Duck. It's not quite. The, uh, the snail or the tortoise and the hare, but perhaps this is the new story, the snail and the duck. We'll see which decks they are going to be playing in this game number one as well. Always important, of course, to start off well just to get a little bit of confidence built for your team by getting a win. And when you have just won a game as well, and then you're communicating with your teammates therefore after, you're going to be feeling a little bit better about yourself. You won't be down. You won't be thinking about the past game. So always nice to start off early. Now, Gaiden is going to be starting with that mage, and Feelink is going to have the Druid. What do you think we're going to see here, though, Falcon? Well, based off of yesterday, the Druid is, is a complete 50-50. Yep. It could be J Druid, and it could be the aggressive style. And although, based off of previous experiences, I thought the aggressive style was the popular one, Jade has been just as common recently. Mage, uh, surprisingly, this... Um, I've been calling it Control Mage. Some of the UK casters I've been speaking to have said that that's a terrible name for the deck. It's more like a chip away and deal damage to Mage. It doesn't or, quite have a ring to uh, it. Though, Discover it? Mage or Gunther Mage or apparently some other names that it's been given. But that deck has been very, very popular. Well, there you go. If you're at home and you're, you want to make a name for Control Mage, perhaps you can be the one who decides what it's called and you'll be famous for the rest of your days. But yeah, that's certainly been the, the popular Mage choice as of late. I mean, Agro Druid, Compared with Jade Druid, I guess Jade Druid kind of has the more consistency. So it really depends how you feel as a player and your kind of play style that you go for. We just witnessed how crazy the aggressive Druid oh, yeah. can be. Well, they have incredibly different strengths and weaknesses, whereas the Jade Druid is very, very weak to the aggressive decks. Uh, historically, it always was even before N'Goro. Uh, the Aggro Druid is actually faster than most of the other aggressive decks, able to create a very wide board, and as a result, tend to be favored in those matchups. Yeah, definitely. And... Uh, to be honest, against a mage, I wonder whether people are going to start changing their mind on what mage they bring. Because if it's got to a point, and I spoke to it, uh, to Lorinda briefly as well, you don't want to get predictable. Hmm. If everyone's bringing control mage or whatever you want to call it at home, then you're going to start to be able to tech accordingly well, if you know you're going to face against This it. is the great thing about the Ungoro, like the beginning of the new meta, because before people were saying, Freeze Mage is going to be awful now with the rotation. Then suddenly, Freeze Mage is the big deck. I believe last week was all about the Freeze Mage. This week, it's all about the Control Mage. What's it going to be about next week? We've got no idea. Yeah, I mean, the, the scary thing about Freeze Mage is that everyone counts it out, and then somehow it trickles back into the meta every time. And now there's a certain 
few players that are responsible for that, that they will try and make Freeze Mage, <laughs> Laughing. Freeze oh. Mage yeah, yeah. constantly <laughs> work, where they just don't let it die. I mean, Freeze Mage has been around since I can remember when I first started playing. I think it was one of the first decks I began playing when I started Hearthstone, and the fact it's still alive is kind of crazy. And the fact it hasn't died yet, despite Unguru introducing so many new cards, has been, well, to be honest, quite surprising that it's, it's still around. But... Game number one is going to get going, Ooh. and it is going to be... It still could be either mage. It could be either. But the druid is pretty clear, I think. Uh, I'd like to think so. Jade Idol kind of rings a little bit of a bell for me <laughs> to suggest it's a, a jade druid here. Do you keep Fandral ever? I mean, I've seen a lot of people keep Fandral if you've got an Innovate, perhaps, but I guess you just get rid of it in this so instance. The problem is, decks like Burn Mage exist. Yep. And as a result, keeping the more control-heavy cards can be quite risky. It's one of the reasons that actually you, you, you throw the quest if you're playing Warrior against Mage, because the quest doesn't actually do much against Freeze Mage, you need the armor, uh, and if you keep the quest against Burn Mage, you're, you're not going to get the chance to complete it. Um, so but just Burn Mage's existence actually uh, makes decisions like that harder, and yeah, you can see Felink has thrown away Fandral. Uh, there's a bit of a crossroads, by the way, when it comes to the Spain team, because two of the players are professional Hearthstone players. The other two are huge, famous YouTubers okay. who don't have the professional experience. And I was speaking to Evangelion earlier today, and he was saying this week they have been working very, very hard to train up the YouTubers and try and get them all to the same level. Uh, it's not something you can do in a week, but Feelink representing one of the YouTubers here. I mean, that's something that we've seen because of the voting process in Global Games and how these players have been introduced to the teams. Popular players have been put onto teams and they are having to be trained up by the professionals as well. So that's a very good point to make. And it comes down to how well these anchors are training the players that have been added to their team. And then we look at Argentina, who don't have their anchor today. And that's why I'm a little bit worried as to how this game is going to play out, because it is that three versus four. But you never know. Sometimes having four players might be too much, so they may even benefit from it. Who knows? Spain's hard work versus the loss of PNC, one of the best players in America, like in the whole region. Um, yeah, it could definitely shift the tide in favor of Spain. Feeling picking up Jade Blossom there right on time. It's one of those cards that the later into the game you get this, the less impactful it is. Unlike Wild Growth, you can't use it to get a card draw on 10 mana. It literally just becomes summon a Jade Golem. Yeah, plenty of ramp as well for Feeling and Spain now, which will just allow them to play those bigger threats a lot earlier on, of course. Now for Nell Gaiden. A bit of a clunky hand, a couple of Doomsayers, Amadeeb's Valets, but there are no secrets to boot, nothing to work with. Maybe you could use the Glyph to search for something here. You're not immediately threatened by this board. You could even just ping off the 1-1 one, one and then go face with the Loot Hoarder, to be honest. I don't know if we ever, if we did establish this yet, but it's it's now pretty clearly a Freeze Mage. Uh, Doomsayer is not a card, oddly enough, Doomsayer is actually a very strong card in control decks, uh, typically, yep. which is maybe a reason people aren't liking uh, the, the Mage deck referred to as Control Mage, because there are some tempo cards, but there are also some very non-tempo cards, so we definitely need to come up with something for that. Uh, yeah, Freeze Mage here. One of the first appearances this week, and there's Icebox as well, off the top as well. So the Medivh's Valet will be playable next turn. Of course, it would have been playable as a 2-3, but you'll get the Battle Cry as well. But just as everything has been falling for Feelink, the Jade Behemoth will come through. That's going to be a 3-6 and a 2-2 on board, and just more of a threat that Argentina have to worry about. You know what can deal 6 damage, though? Two Medivh's Valets? Two Medivh's Valets can, in fact, deal 6 damage. The question is, is it worth it? Maybe there is a world where this Jade Behemoth never dies this game. Maybe you just have to leave it there and save the damage for the face. I actually kind of like the double Medivh's Valet, to be honest, but I think you're completely right. You need to be thinking about where are you going to generate the amount of damage that's going to go to the face. I mean, Druid does have the ability to gain armor as well, mm -hmm. of course, through Fell Rage and armoring up with their hero power. So they need to be considering where they want this damage to go. Oh, is that hitting the... Ah, uh, interesting. They're setting up a Doomsayer play. So, kind of went with one. They didn't go with one of the plays we described, but they went with something in the middle. Um, obviously, Argentina will have discussed that play at length. Freeze Mage is never a deck that is going to take board control. So, uh, and although getting 
getting rid of the Jade Behemoth and putting 2 2 3s on the board would create some board control. The Druid would get rid of the cards and then eventually, as you say, start picking up armor. I like this. It slows down the Druid's progression. If the Doomsayer can't be cleared, no Jade Golems are going to come down now, and it, it just essentially buys the Freeze Mage more time. So there are ways to get rid of this Doomsayer for feeling here. You can obviously use the Swipe if needs be, as Wrath as well. But it's... Are you wanting to use them straight away? I mean, how much do you want to keep this 3-6 on board? Of course, you could use Drew of the Claw as well with Charge. I think they just want to keep a board presence. Just keep putting as much pressure as they can into Argentina here. I really did like the play by now, Gaiden, uh, putting the, the Doomsayer on the board there because it did make it tough for Spain. How many resources do you put into clearing the Doomsayer? It's a difficult question to answer. This seems like a very nice outcome for Felix there. He developed more of a board, didn't waste any of the damage in his hand, and also put down Thanos, which is great for helping him cycle through the deck a little bit more. So that glyph in the hand, I mean, it's kind of a panic button in some cases. In this case, it might be because they need to find a freeze effect at some point. They could, of course, use Arcane Intellect. They want to start searching for it as well because the board is going to slowly start to get scary from Spain. Of course, Flame Strike is available on turn 7, which is something they'll be thinking about. But it's whether Spain can put so much board presence and just continuously uh, jam enough damage into the face of Argentina that Argentina just can't respond to that. That rope is burning. Something, of course, that we see a lot during the Hearthstone Global Games because of the team play. Fireball and Frostbolt, two of the best uh, cards that you can get from Primordial Glyph. I'm going to take the Fireball, just wanting as much damage as possible. And a two-mana Fireball to go with maybe your other two Fireballs for a 10-mana 18 damage combo works out pretty nicely in this deck. Definitely does, and the trade coming through as well so that Flame Strike is very effective next turn with the coin. And Spain will know that for sure. Feeling is going to be well aware that a flame strike is possible is possible here, and he's actually going to wrath his own minion just to cycle and find different lines of play here. And that might include ooh, Aya is actually huge oh, because it survives the flame strike. I was kind of thinking Jade Idol might be a possibility, but no, Aya is a big pickup. Yeah, Aya is is incredible for feeling mm. there, and feeling knows it. He just. A little bit of a smile going on. Uh, Flame Strike's one of the more interesting cards in Freeze Mage because it's one that's not in every list. Yeah. The standard Freeze Mage list has approximately 28 of the same cards, and then Flame Strike is sometimes 29, and then with number 30, it's a question of do you run double Pyroblast or Pyroblast and Antonidas. Uh, coining out the Flame Strike now, though, exactly as you said, leaving a 4 4 on the board, not the end of the world for Argentina. Uh, they were a little bit frustrating, but they didn't get a complete clear. So I wonder if you start cycling now. I mean, if it was turn 10, then I'd be very tempted with the Auctioneer and then Wild Growth. But of course, it's only turn 9, so that Wild Growth is pretty much useless, except to draw just one card in this case. Maybe even just Drew to the Claw, uh, make it a 4-6, and continue to go face armor up as well. I definitely like the Druid of the Claw here. You're right, Gadgetan Auctioneer, so tempting. Like, you just, you just want to start going off, but it's just not worth it when you've got Wild Growth in your hand. Wild Growth, which represents three draws with the Gadgetan Auctioneer once you're on 10 mana. And next turn, it's time, so just wait a little bit longer. And those shapeshifts, just one of them, it, they could be very important as well coming later. And just generating that one extra armor every other turn uh -huh. might help out when uh, the Freeze Mage tries to get that burst damage in later on. Now, the way the, the Jade Druid beats the Freeze Mage consistently is, as, as you, you mentioned right at the beginning of this game, it's the armor gain cards. Yep. It's the Feral Rage and it's the Earthen Scales. Uh, Earthen Scales being this extra tool that the Druid's got in Ungoro Crater, which is even better than Feral Rage because the Jade Golems can get pretty big when we're getting 8, 8, 9, 9 Jade Golems. Then that card is, is gain 10 armor which is uh, its a lot of armor, a lot of extra damage for the Freeze Mage to have to deal. So does that put the Freeze Mage on a timer then? If, if they are well aware that there is so much possible armor generation from the Druid, they need to be thinking about, okay, when do we start putting the damage to face? Is it just a case of waiting for that Alex Straza, or are they going to be counting how much damage they've got in hand now? There are so many intricacies when it comes to that question. Like, are we on a timer here? Uh, 
It depends how much the maximum output the mage can deal is, and that depends on a bunch of things, including Primordial Glyph. Yep. Uh, and Tinnitus, how many fireballs that creates. The other thing is, of course, Alex Jarza does nothing to armor. Uh, if the mage puts the druid down to around 15, the druid gains armor, and then the mage picks up Alex Jarza, the Alex is useless. So it's, it's pretty important that the mage doesn't start dealing damage to the druid's face until Alex is drawn. Um, so there are a lot of different factors at play here. No ar armor gain picked up just yet, though, from Spain. And perhaps that's what they were searching for. Another glyph available for Nelgaiden to search for even more damage if they want it. But I guess they don't really need to panic about damage just yet. Blizzard is a possibility, but you also really need to, to get rid of his auctioneer, to be honest, because otherwise that armor gain is going to be found very quickly. Yeah, it is a shame that the auctioneer hasn't picked up armor yet. We're, we're, we've got to be around halfway through the deck by now. I think deeper... Uh, though it is still only turn 8 for the mage, it seems like it's further into the game than that for the druid due to all of the ramp earlier. Um, and there is a high chance that the auctioneer survives. If you're the mage right now, if you're Nagaiden, do you actually want to waste burn damage on this Gadgetan auctioneer? I, I, I think you do. I think you I think to. maybe Blizzard plus the Medivh's Valet is a good way to get rid of it because you're also freezing the board, you, it means you're not taking any damage at the moment. He's just going to go for a ping. Okay. That's fine. So the reason I like this is because you're only leaving nine damage on the board. And that, that seems like a lot, but you've got 17 health. You've just put Ice Barrier down. So you have 25 health, really. Um, Ice Barrier buys you an entire extra turn when played in this scenario. Uh, and, and so, yeah, this is absolutely fine. Blizzard can come down a little bit later once the Jade Golems are a little bit bigger. Yeah. And then buy Argentina another turn. And then Frost Nova buys another turn. And... Alternatively, Frost Nova gets played with Antonidas, of course. Yeah, and that's always been the story for Freeze Mage, to be honest. It's about just staying calm in these situations and saying, we don't need to use this yet. When do we need to use it? Let's worry about it when there are 9-9s, 10-10s on the board. So there we go. Good stuff coming out from Argentina. But that is one of the earthen scales that you were talking about. A lot of armor gain is possible if you're able to get a massive Jade Golem. Yeah, so it's not like now he's picked up the Earthen Scales, it's easy. You know, we win the game every time, we just it's simple. It's not. You have to work out when to play the Earthen Scales. Chances are you can save it until something big like Alex Strauss has come down when you know that you're in some danger. There's no need to just randomly play it now when you've still got full health, when you could potentially get more value out of it later. Yeah, and Spain want to be putting Argentina on a timer now, so they are just going to put damage to face. Not worry about this 2-3, because with the creep coming down, that's going to be very difficult for Argentina to deal with efficiently anyway. Another Ice Barrier is available off the top as well. They've got the choice to search for more spells with the Glyph. And we've got to remember that Frost Nova plus Doomsayer is a possibility at any point. But again, we'll go back to is it when you are in panic mode? You need to do it when those jades are really big. At the moment, they need to just be thinking about what's our game plan here, to be honest. The idea for Argentina, I think, is to start freezing the board when the board is big enough to pop your ice block. Yep. As it happens, they've just picked up their second ice barrier, and it's, I think, almost impossible for Spain to pop the ice block uh, with I when Ice Barrier is in play as well. Interesting that they've decided to go ahead and play this glyph. I was wondering if they were maybe saving it for Antonidas as it's an extra fireball potentially, but these aren't really what you want. Th that said, if Spellbender managed to catch Earth and Scales, that could mess up Feeling's game plan entirely. Yes, it could indeed, and perhaps that's the, the thought process for Nelgaiden here and Argentina. As you said, are roping off as well as we've seen a lot during uh, Global Games because of the amount of communication. If you are new to the Global Games, all teammates can communicate using whatever device that they seem fit or they can be around each other's houses. We've seen a few players have been doing that. They've been playing together in the same room as well. And that's the most fun, isn't it? Yeah. When you can see the players laughing together, high-fiving together. Uh, it's, just, it's just some friends having fun playing Hearthstone and ultimately that's what it's all about. Wrath is available just to deal with the 2-3 if they wanted to, but I, I guess now for Spain is they are looking at how do we get as much on the board as possible to be a real threat to Argentina here. Because they need to be chipping away at Argentina enough to be putting them in a, a bad place so that it's not comfortable and it's not an easy decision for Argentina to make. 
Yeah, decisions with this type of game do tend to be quite difficult. Spellbender comes down. Unfortunately for Night Gaiden, it's not as it's not as exciting as it could have been. Spellbender creates some very interesting scenarios when it yep. gets picked up, and players don't think about it. Um, just because the interaction is so weird. With Earthen Scales, it would have meant Feelink only gains two armor. Unfortunately for Feelink, uh, sorry, unfortunately for Now Gaiden, that wasn't to happen this game. And now he's going to have to hope that he starts picking up cards like Alex Straza that he needs very, very soon. And if he doesn't, then I guess this may be the turn where you need to be thinking about the Frost Nova because your Ice Block can be popped in this turn. I'm, I think I kind of like just freezing. Yeah. Maybe they might even just go for Blizzard rather than the Doomsayer this turn. I like Blizzard Doomsayer here. It's using the cards that cost the most mana okay. so that later on you can squeeze Frost Nova in again, ideally with an Antonidas. Uh, yeah, putting down Doomsayer potentially buys you an extra turn. If you can reduce the board to a state where there is, you know, only there's less than three damage on it, then you might feel safe enough to not even have to freeze the board the next turn. You might believe your your ice block stays up regardless. So decision here for Feelink: Do you double swipe this Doomsayer? Uh, it looks like he's answered that question before yep. I had the chance to. Very quick decision for Team Spain there. Not much discussion happening there. And now uh, Spain get to keep their big board. They do, and that's where the, the Frost Nova is going to come into play now for Argentina, that they have got it as a backup plan just to stall ever <laughs> so slightly. And there is more stall. There's a Blizzard as well, so I expect that to come through here. This is where Freeze Mage becomes infuriating to play against, but pretty satisfying to play if you're sat uh, in Argentina's side. And they are going to be able to deal with uh, plenty of this board, so who needs a Doomsayer when you can just Blizzard and then ping and use your minions that were left over from that previous Doomsayer turn. And now, they are in a good spot, Spain. I, I don't think they'll be worried at the moment because they're looking at the hand size of Argentina and they're saying, realistically, they don't have much burst at the moment. We're only worried when Alex Draza comes down, and when Alex Draza does come down, that's when they can perhaps go into panic mode and start using that Earthen Scales. I mean, you say they don't have much burst, but I'm looking at 15 damage for 10 mana. That is a that's a pretty big number. That's half your health total. I guess it's not 31 is, is the point that <laughs> yeah, I was okay. making. That's, um, that's fair, that's fair. It's not 31, and therefore there's no need to rush the Earthen Scales. You know Freeze Mage is not in a place anymore that it used to be where it can deal 31 mm -hmm. damage. Evolve Kobold, Emperor Thorisan, Ice Lance, those cards are gone, and although it can, thanks to some primordial glyph sneakiness, deal more damage than it's supposed to be able to deal, it, it's not quite able to deal 31 damage, I think, in any circumstance. Another Jade Spirit picked up as well, which just means more Jade generation, which means bigger Jades, which means a better Earthen Scales when you need it as well. But the Nourish will come through from Spain, and there's a second Earthen Scales, which may just put the the nail in the coffin, to be honest, when it comes to the Freeze Mage here. Feelink wondering where his Gadgetan Auctioneer is. Now he's picked up both Innovates. Um, but yeah, I, I think that is just the game plan now. Make these Jades as big as possible. Double Earthen Scale is potentially 20 additional armor. I don't think now Gaiden is going to be able to deal that much extra damage. I think this game is heavily tipping towards, the Spain, towards Team Spain here. And it's been like that from the get-go, to be honest. They've been in so much control. And I know it always feels like you're in control when you're against a Freeze Mage and they, they aren't able to do the crazy things Freeze Mage does. But it can be, as you said, very frustrating when they're constantly freezing your board and they're able to eliminate it. But when you're playing Jade Druid and you can just generate threat after threat after threat, it becomes a very easy game. But I say it's an easy game. Alex Straza comes down, and Argentina will be thinking, okay, yeah. maybe we're back into this, no, but no. we can see that that's not... Now, Gaiden is about to get some very bad news, as we all know. Uh, it's possible that Feelink even... This is probably what they're discussing right now. Do you go the extra mile? Maybe you trade in the, the weaker Jade you've got, play Jade Idol, and play Jade Spirit. Uh, you'd have to make a few trades in order for that to work. I think he... Yeah, he can trade in three, three minions, and then play the double Earthen Scales on the biggest Jade Golem which would mean 22 armor. Alternatively, it looks like Spain have decided that's not necessary. We don't need to gain that much armor. Oh, no, they can do it. There's still three spaces. My apologies. They want to gain as much armor as they can just to rub salt in the wound here. I mean, I think even seven damage would be plenty, but 
they're going to be going the full whack here and they will be saying to Argentina and Nile Gaiden, well, what are you going to do now? Oh, the question is why play it close when you can do this? Exactly. 23 yeah. armor, there is very little chance. Well, actually, I'm going to say no chance for Argentina to get back into this one unless... I mean, what, what are their outs here? Apart from Yogg. If the rest of their deck consists of Pyroblasts, then actually, no, they still lose because the board just uh, hits Argentina in the face for a lot more damage than necessary, actually. Uh, Argentina wishing they had the board that Spain has right now because if they did, they'd be able to win this. Argentina are still considering what could change in this game. What is their options? How much burn damage do we have left? Can we even chip away at 39? I mean, is Archmage in this? Do we see Archmage during the Mulligan? Antinodus. I guess that is a possible option for them. The Mulligan but... it was a long time ago. Yeah, it was. It does feel like a long time ago. Uh, I'm sure we'll see it soon. I find it highly unlikely that there isn't an Antinodus. I think if there's no Antinodus, then you just concede immediately. Two Pyroblast is not going to do anything against the 30, uh, 36 health. Well, the Frostbolt does mean that they were able to keep that ice block for one more turn and they're going to use that pyroblast to take them down to 26 now their ice block will be popped yeah it's a good time to play pyroblast as well you've got the ice block up you're safe essentially use it when you don't need the mana for anything else but it's 27 damage still like we we spoke earlier and said how Freeze Mage now struggles to, to do the 30 damage that it, we saw it do with like the Cabal Geomancer, for example. And we have the Honorable Ping to the face to finish the game off. So Spain eventually, after a long fight, will go 1-0 up. Playing it perfectly and those Earthen Scales really coming into play. I remember during the Tespa uh, a few weeks ago, I said the Earthen Scales was a, a really interesting card. And there was a lot of people who said, ah, I don't think it will see play. Well, ha! Yes, it did. Well, so much has changed over the course of the Ungoro meta. Yep. As I was saying earlier, Freeze Mage blew up at some point, and at around the same time, Earthen Scales... It turns out gaming arm, gaining armor is good against Freeze Mage. Who oh. I know. I, I, I had we've no seen idea. it before or something yeah. like that. Uh, now Gaiden still going to get a chance to prove himself. Once again, he will be playing instead of PNC today. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it. Mm. Uh, according to the rules of the Hearthstone Global Games, as long as the players let us know nice and early, then a second player of the team can just step up and replace them and play two games. And if he can step up and perhaps win another game, then maybe he can make up for that, uh, that previous loss yeah. that we've just mm. witnessed. I mean, I wonder if PNC is kind of sitting at home or, or elsewhere where he may be, just kind of tapping yeah. away saying, you should have won yeah, that. This is this, you're doing this for you my name. come back and win this next and, one. And to be fair to Nell Gaiden, it, it feels bad enough losing one game in a team competition, but losing twice for the team uh, definitely wouldn't feel good. So he is going to be very keen to win that one. But next up, Snail versus Evangelion. We're going to have a Paladin mirror match. The Paladin off. And do we think we're going to be seeing the same aggressive Murloc? It's kind of, I like to say it's Murloc mid-range, because there are cards that aren't just sheer aggression. Of course, uh, where Tyrion on, coming into it. As where well. on the spectrum are we right now? Where on the where on the spectrum are we? Because there's the there's the incredibly aggressive Murloc decks, which have cards like Grimscale Chum and the uh, and the Cold Light uh, Seer cards like that, which are purely aggressive. Topping out at Tyrion, absolutely. Tyrion is quite an aggressive card, though. Uh, then there's the mid-range slower Paladin decks with the uh, with the Discover card. Um, and the other slow things like that. Sunky Pitarum, I think Sunky Pitarum can appear in both. Yep, he can appear in both. And then of course there is there is just normal mid-range Paladin as well, without the Murloc package. I've seen that being played a little bit as It does well. exist. It's less common, but it does exist. And we've seen Murloc Paladin lose twice already today. And the amount of times I've said, do you want to be predictable? Are they going to be predictable? Are they going to go for that Murloc Paladin? Or do you think that we will see something a little bit different? I mean, Murloc... Aggressive Murloc Paladin does seem to be the favourite one, but uh, there's a few facts for you on Snail, and uh, I'm not going to say his name because I'm going to say it is wrong. I'm going to allow you to say it. And Evangelion. Evangelion, what uh, Evangelion, as it says here on screen, I was going to say this one anyway, did win DreamHack Valencia last year. Uh, he is one of the, the pro player half of Team Spain. Uh, who's been training up the YouTuber half. Feelink, who actually won the last game, is part of the YouTuber uh, team. So, good start from Spain all in all there when you look at it that way. That's a really interesting fact as well, that he plays for Valencia 
CF Esports. So that is actually the football team, the Spanish football team that is taking on an esports team. We've seen a lot of football teams doing that throughout the world, just trying to get involved in esports. It shows how much esports has grown. On the other side, Snail says that apparently Argentina has the best meat in the entire world. And that anyone who disagrees doesn't have a clue. Do you agree? that Argentina has the best meat in the entire world. I hate to say it, I haven't I haven't had the opportunity to test that out just yet. Doesn't have a clue. Uh, uh, Snail does uh, coach Hearthstone, by the way, and he plays for two Hearthstone Flamingos. Oh, that sounds like a fantastic Snail that plays for the fl Flamingos versus the Ducks. What is this? What is this animal-friendly series of Hearthstone? But we're going to have the Paladin off. We're going to have Paladin versus Paladin. Let's say it is the, the Murloc versus Murloc game. The Mulligan is so... Blummin' important. I, I think that's... You could say that about most games, but when it comes to aggression versus aggression, if you can get turn one into turn two, then you can just immediately punish your opponent. They just have the same cards. Like, that, that's, that's all there is to this game. Except uh, there's no gold and true silver champions, so he should probably just mulligan that one. That's true. The golden ones always win, right? Yeah, that's how it works. Uh, yeah, but the more aggressive the Paladin deck is, the more important the Mulligan is, exactly as you say. I mentioned this yesterday, I mentioned it again today. I queued up against Sotul last week, both of us playing Murloc Paladin, and um, he had the 1 2 3 start. I might, the first card I could play was on turn 3. He completely steamrolled me, game was over by turn 4. Um, it, it's painful to not start on curve in these aggressive decks. Glacacrawla, it's the wrong type of crab. We see both crabs nowadays in Hearthstone. Glacocrawl is not the one that Evangelion wants in this matchup. I'm wondering whether we might see Murloc Paladin decks include Hungry Crab in their own deck, because it might work out that you can get an incredible 3-4 off of it as well, just destroying one of your own 1-1s, for example, if you've just used the Inquisitor like we've seen. Hey, Pirates are doing it. Pirates are running Glacocrawl, so why not? Exactly, and Glacocrawl does seem to be falling out of favor, to be honest, because there hasn't been... <laughs> As much pirates as we saw before Unguru came out, because that's of the, for sure. It's because of the uprising of the Murlocs, the uh, the shift of the tribes that are in command of the game. So now Galakakrula is, I guess, the only option here for Spain. Of course, they could hero power as well if they wanted another Murloc on board in case they top deck something like a war leader, which yeah. would then be very effective if any of the minions were left alive. It's as we were saying a moment ago, though, like the one, two, three curve in these decks are very, very important. Evangelion, uh, I'm pretty certain he's going to want to play the Galaka Crawler here. He needs something that actually contests the Rockpool Hunter. If he just hero powered, Rockpool Hunter could just get a free kill on the on the uh, token, and Evangelion would be a little bit behind on the board. At least now, Galaka Crawler trades favorably with the Rockpool Hunter, though uh, Evangelion's going to get some bad news and that is that Snail has a second Rockpool Hunter to buff up the first and uh, get rid of that crab. It does mean the Inquisitor will be able to trade and take down one of the Rockpool Hunters, I guess, but we're looking at Spain's hand, and we said about how these decks can be quite aggressive, but Ivory Knight would suggest that it's uh, even more tailored towards the mid-range variant, and they've drawn three of their six mana cards. Let they need to be drawing something that can immediately answer this board, Otherwise, as you said, it can just spiral out of control for a uh, Murloc Paladin. Yeah, I mean, just to paraphrase what you just said, where's the 3-drop? <laughs> Where is Evangelion 3-drop? Even another 1-mana card would be okay here, so he can just play his hero power with it. Wow, really interesting trade coming through there. And Peacekeeper might actually punish that trade, it actually does punish that trade massively. Because now you can play the Peacekeeper onto the 3-2 Hunter, and then you can trade and get rid of him off the board nice comfortably. Yeah, Evangelion finding his 3-drop. There's his 3-drop, yeah. There's his 3-drop. And a pretty good one in this situation at that, exactly as you said. Uh, trading off with the minion with the least health is potentially sometimes a good play because it gives you more options later on. It makes things harder because it kind of forced Evangelion to, to make the trade there, though Adol Peacekeeper uh, really did punish Snail for making that decision. I guess War Leader can come down to uh, to trade off the Peacekeeper, but that Galaka Crawler will still be a bit of a, a nuisance on the board. But unless Spain are able to get something off the top that's going to help them with this board, as they just did with the Peacekeeper, they're going to struggle to remove that War Leader. So we are seeing now a match of what it would seem the aggressive variant of this deck from Argentina and the more mid range deck from um, Spain here. Yeah. And to be honest, I, I think that the, the more mid range version. If it's able to compete with the early board, 
then it should be able to take down this oh. game. And there's a way to deal with the Murloc this board is, leader. This is such a great way, as you said, of competing with this early board. Uh, Murloc Tidecaller, of course, being indicative of the aggressive version. And Ivory Knight being indicative of the slower version. Otherwise, there is so much overlap between these Paladin decks. It can be difficult to tell. Divine Favor, also yep. uh, a card that you'll only see in the aggressive decks because you want to empty your hand. And the mid-range ones find it harder to do that. Uh, can we just point out how important that Consecrate was? Because, I mean, if oh, yeah. Gentle Megasaur had come down onto two Murlocs, then that's potentially a game-winning play if your adapts are good ones. But that's another Peacekeeper coming off the top now from Evangelion. And answer after answer coming off the top. And now we have the six drops that have been sat in his hand for so long. Perfect. It's actually really working out. If Evangelion can keep even one minion on the board, then Sunkey Patarium next turn is going to be uh, ginormous for, for him. Uh, Gentle Megasaur coming down on its own. A little bit awkward. We discussed this a lot yesterday, but 5-4 body for 4 mana is okay. It's just a bit of a shame when you miss out on the Murloc buffing. Uh, War Leader being destroyed. Possibly the most important thing that's happened this game, actually, because that is a card where if it sticks around in either of these decks, uh, it just dominates the board. So that Consecration was... We can't really express how big it was. Yeah. And now the reply of a Consecration from Snare will allow him to clear the board. Can play the Tide Cooler as well, just to get some form of a Murloc presence in case he plays that Gentle Megasaur next turn. But hey -o. There's another Consecration. Who'd have thought another answer being drawn from Spain? But I guess you don't have to panic and hit this Consecration immediately because you do have uh, other options. You could just play the Ivory Knight, perhaps. But it looks like they are more concerned about clearing this board. And I guess when you're up against the more aggressive variant, you just need to keep as much board control as possible. Yeah, keeping a Murloc on the board is also a little bit questionable, especially a Murloc which buffs itself every time there's another Murloc. We can see there is a Gentle Megasaur in hand. There's a Sunky Patarum in hand. If both of those minions survived, then that would have been horrible for Spain. Uh, it is funny that we've seen so many Consecrations already. Some of these Paladin decks, more so the aggressive ones, are only running one. Some of them aren't running any, but it's, it's more common for, for there to be at least one in the deck. Uh, Evangelion, of course, having played both of his Consecrations already. Now we'll see Hydrologist dropping, and the choices, I mean, like they're not really fantastic. Maybe something like a Redemption would have been good here, because for Argentina, they're looking, away, looking at a way of trying to sustain this board. They want to keep stuff alive so that they can get the value out of the Megasaur, out of the Sunkeeper. However, they're going to struggle to do so when this board is being removed so easily by Spain at the moment. So, Getaway Kodo is the one that I think they were looking for because, uh, I mean, if it was just played on this board and the Hydrologist gets destroyed, you just play it again, get another secret. Infinite value. Uh, Getaway Kodo on Gentle Megasaur means it gets its Adapt again. Uh, on Sunkeeper Tyro means it gets its Battle Cry again. It's, it's a card that wasn't strong when it first came out, but it turns out if you don't have to put it in your deck, it's pretty insane. Sunkeeper Tyro gets a lot of value here. You can just trade off with that poisonous Hydrologist after the Adapt. And just keep control of this board here. He has Ragnaros the Light Lord to follow up as well. Plenty of big threats coming through. Of course, for Argentina, they need to be thinking about, OK, so this seems to be the mid-range variant. How valuable is our Sunkey Patarium going to be later on? Or do we need to be playing it now just to keep any sort of presence? Here? The reverse Sunkey Patarium. It's difficult, but again, it's one of these situations where imagine how good Getaway Kodo would be. You play the Tarim, you make the trade. When your Tarim gets destroyed, it just pops back into your hand. You play it again later. I guess Tarim into Repentance is actually really nice here. Because if you are worried about a big threat coming through from Spain, then immediately that's going to be chop down to one health and then you've got your blue gear warrior to use as a ping effect that's later true on. and then you can refill your hand with divine favor as well and we're looking at evangelion's hand and we're knowing that that repentance would be fantastic right yeah. now ragnaros light lord being an eight one is just very very good for argentina uh counter argument to that would be it's not so great against Tyrion. Tyrion is a card that needs to be dealt with in some way uh but here we go argentina making the play snail popping down sunky patarium Making the, re well, the reverse on Kibataram, as I mentioned before. And hey, there is the Tyrion pickup, <laughs> which uh, will punish Snail a little bit, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's going to become a, a 6 1, right? The Blue Gear will allow him to deal with it and keep a little bit of a board presence, but that is the perfect answer. I mean, Spain have just drawn so many answers so far this game after having quite a clunky hand. And I guess that's what happens when you draw some of your higher end. Um, minions or spells, you are going to be drawing more effective stuff that you can play in the early game. The Divine Favor comes through to uh, just 
regenerate this board, to be honest. Yeah. Evangelion was talking very, very quickly there after the Tyrion got uh, downsized. I don't think it was something that Team Spain were expecting. Blue Warrior really getting some value there. And you're right, Divine Favor, maybe even MVP of this match because Snail was completely out of steam before. And now look at this. Um, an extra Murloc on board, two Murlocs in the hand. It's looking pretty good. I mean, Ragnaros Light Lord, I guess, would get value. You could use your weapon to hit into the 3 7 just to make it a 3 2 and then play Ragnaros. And then you'll get full value out of it, healing up. But is it a waste? Uh, is that a panic situation? Maybe Ivory Knight coming down instead? But I guess Spain's game at the moment has been just clearing the board in the best way possible. Okay. Okay, this works too. I was trying to think about Rag Light Lord and whether or not you do hit the weapon in that respect, but this works out very well. Um, now, Snail is going to find it very, very hard to clear this wall leader, and if he does have to trade in the Tarim, obviously that gets destroyed too. Grimscale Chum not going to do that much this late into the game, and although Snail can create a pretty big board full of Murlocs, they're not strong enough. They're not doing anything. There's no wall leader. And they have to get through double taunt as well, which is going to be very difficult and even a crazy secret here isn't really gonna help them maybe something like a getaway code might help Ooh. them refill the hand if it's gonna be Sunkey Pataram that dies then you might get a lot of value out of that Sunkey Pataram's got taunt right so uh, potentially buffing all of these Murlocs or well, it doesn't actually buff them by much but buffing the 1-1 one -one as well I think there is a net profit from playing Tarim again and also of course nerfing yep. the Murloc war leader as you were just about to say I can tell that was the yeah, that was the important factor and now Spain and Evangel Evangelion. Did I get that that's right? That's it. That's we it. Perfect. There is the end. It only took almost two games. Primordial yeah. Drake coming through actually will punish that secret. Will it? No, it won't. I was going to say it will kill off, but that Sunky Pataran will die first. That's right. They, it will destroy the 1-1 one -one as well, but because uh, it's based on play order, Sunky Pataran will be the card returned to the hand, and next turn, uh, Hero Power plus Tarim seems very strong no matter which way you look at it. It will mean that Spain are just going to trade here. They will just get rid oh, yeah. of what they can, and you need to do it in the best way possible. So you want to get rid of that Tide Cooler because that's the the biggest threat that you've got to worry about. You're not really too concerned about using the the life points of your Murloc War Leader because you know full well that it's going to turn into a 3-3 very soon. Yeah. Uh, in theory, Evangelion doesn't mind trading anyway. He's the more controlly deck, so ultimately, if, if everyone's trading all day and no one's killing anyone, then eventually Evangelion will be the person that wins. Uh, it's just it's just an annoying situation to be in, knowing that that Tarim's there. I still don't think he's got too much to worry about just yet. No, I don't. I don't think he does either. Yes, okay, you can get rid of the two taunts, but then you're going to be generating another taunt whilst you're at it as well. And there'll still be a 1-1 one -one on the board. And you know that Evangelion has still two cards in hand. Two cards that he's been holding for quite a while now. So you'd like, well, you certainly presume that they're going to be high-end impact minions that they can be thrown onto the board. The other thing Evangelion uh, can, can feel a little bit comfortable about is that he has seen both gentle Megasaurs. Mm. So even in this crazy scenario where Argentina build up another board full of Murlocs, mm. which right now is seeming unlikely. Uh, it's not It's not a huge threat. At least one Murloc war leader is already gone, and the card that can cause the Murlocs to one turn kill you, uh, both of those are gone. And these are the situations that are the most frustrating uh, within Hearthstone, I think. When you run out of all of your cards, you are playing the aggressive deck, you know full well you're playing against a more control variant, you know your back's against the wall and you're struggling at this point, but you have to play on and you have to go for every single out just in case you can even get anything from this game. But there is so much for Spain to work with here. Yep, Spain, especially picking up Stonehill Defender, uh, one of the best cards in Ungaro and particularly good in Paladin as three out of the four Paladin legendaries that are currently in Standard have Taunt. And because of how Discover works, it has a higher percentage chance at getting you a card of your own class. The chance of you picking up a Paladin legendary every time you play this is exceedingly high. 
We've seen it happen, actually. I think there's a few YouTube clips of that happening, like, twice in a row, three legendaries being the choice. Yeah, yesterday, even, in one game, Tyrion was offered to one player twice in a row. Don't think he took it both times, but it's, uh, it's not a rare occurrence. The card is that bonkers in Paladin. Blessing of Kings. Yes, okay, it can generate more damage if they want to put it into the face, but it can't deal with that Ragnaros Light Lord, which is... Uh, well, I, mean, I suppose it can if they use their their face as well. If they really want to go full whack here and just throw everything into this 8-8 Ragnaros. I mean, what would you do in this situation? It feels so bad. In this situation, I would concede. I mean, oh no. If I was on the ladder and if it was a less important tournament. To be fair, I would have conceded after like turn four, so I wouldn't say much. <laughs> Obviously, Snail uh, wants to go on for as long as he possibly can when there's a single glimmer of hope for Snail, for Team Argentina. Uh, they're going to continue playing. If you put everything into the face, Rag Light Lord is just going to heal it all up again. If you put everything into Rag Light Lord, um, you've just wasted a lot of damage. It almost feels as though you have to trade it. No, well, I don't know. You can put the green scale, green, grime, green, grime, green, grime scale chum into the face, I guess. Force the Ragnaros to trade. I don't know. Both plays seem abysmal. But that's the position that Argentina are in. Yep, it is a very tough situation to be in. And now with Ivory Knight and Stonehill Defender as an option for Spain, it's just going to be curtains, to be honest, for Argentina. More taunts that they're going to have to get past and more healing if we want to put on the board as well. Wicker Flame arguably being the worst taunt uh, in, in the Paladin Legendary set. Uh, it's okay against Aggro just because it heals you, but I think when you've got this much mana at your disposal, the Fen Creeper, a three attack, six health taunt, probably does a better job. You're not really worried about your health total just yet. And I mean, let's look at, or let's talk about the leaderboard. Spain, they've already lost a game. They lost 3-0 in their first matchup. Argentina, however, they've won one and they won 3-0. So Spain, if they can somehow take this series, if they can go on to win, well, 3-0, it would be fantastic for them to get back into their group after losing earlier on in a previous week. And to be honest, it's looking like 2-0. It doesn't really matter what they pick. They've got a dino size as well means they're going to heal up for eight as well as being able to slam a 10-10 on the board next turn. Yeah, or just buff up your taunt into a 10-10. That works as well. Uh, a 10-10 taunt, probably quite good against aggro. Who'd have thought? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think Spain are feeling too bad about their loss last time. Uh, they had one of the hardest teams as their opponent. I think it was Russia. I apologize if I got that wrong. I think that I think that's who they played against. Uh, there were a few mistakes on the Spain side as well. There was one game where they accidentally burned the rogue quest, uh, something which obviously Twitch chat have been memeing about a lot. Um, but Spain doing a pretty good job at redeeming themselves today. There is the lethal and Evangelion going to take the second game in a row for Spain. Lethal with dino size as well. I mean, that's something that I don't think many people expect it to happen, but it has happened in that situation. As you said, 2-0 to zero now, Spain in a very comfortable position. And they can, I, I don't think they'll be sitting back and relaxing just yet, but they will definitely be feeling relatively comfortable. Absolutely. Um, maybe they do, yeah, I, th I think comfortable is a good word. Like, you don't feel like, oh yeah, we've won. Yeah. Because reverse sweeps happen. We saw a reverse sweep yesterday. Team Portugal, in fact, uh, were a reverse sweep. After being ex extremely confident, they did lose their first two games and come back. It does happen. It happens regularly in Hearthstone. But, you know, confident confidence is there. That's the important thing. Yeah, I don't think they'll be quite putting it into cruise control. They might just ever so slightly lift their foot off the pedal. But we're moving into game number three, which is going to be Argentina's chance to get back into this. And it's going to be now Gaiden again. Because PNC isn't playing today as the anchor, it means now Gaiden will play twice. And it's going to be Rogue versus Shaman. Are we expecting to see Quest Rogue? What do you think we might see Miracle Rogue? Uh, Rogue versus Shaman. Well, Quest Rogue should be pretty good against the Shaman. Because Shaman has a lot of defensive tools, all the lightning storms, all the walls, all the healing. But Quest Rogue doesn't care. Quest Rogue just cares about completing the quest. And then Quest Rogue cares about dealing stupid amounts of damage in chunks of five to you in one turn. Uh, pressure is on for now Gaiden now. Uh, he lost his first game. If he loses this as well, then he's going to feel like he's let the team down. That's actually Snail, isn't it? It's the same guy that we just watched. That is, that is, that is Snail. That is not now Gaiden. I'm sure we will see now Gaiden in a second. Now Gaiden's just, you know, just calming down. Doesn't want to be on cam right now. Just, I, I, I don't know. That's he's moving forward, but uh, is, <laughs> there is a lot of pressure on now Gaiden, to be honest. If you are stepping up and you are putting yourself in the anchor position, you're playing twice, 
there is going to be a situation where next week they're going to be saying, well, if PNC can't play again, who's going to be stepping up? Now, Gaiden's just potentially lost two games in a row. Well, not in a, quite in a row, but two games in this series. And PNC might say, actually, I'd rather Ildemar play the next <laughs> because he looked more comfortable, for example. Let's just hope PNC can play next week. Uh, again, given that he has such a strong reputation, as you've said multiple times during this cast, he's coming as the anchor. He's coming as one of the best players in the region, not just in the country. Um, the team will be reeling without him. Well, now we are going to move into game number three. As I said, it's going to be Rogue versus the Shaman. That's Shaman, not Shaman. It's going to be the Wisp variant of the Quest Rogue as well. It has become very popular in the past week or so. On the side of the Shaman, however, that is a South Sea deckhand. Yeah, that's where it gets more interesting. Flame Tongue Totem, as we saw yesterday, not even a card that makes it into every Shaman deck anymore. Um, however, this, this is clearly from the Mulligan. Argent Squire, South Sea deckhand, very, very aggressive cards. And if there's a Shaman deck that's going to have a chance against Quest Rogue, this is it. Spain may actually be onto something pretty good here. Yep. And this is going to be a very interesting one, actually, because typically, if you want to go up against Quest Rogue, as you said, you should play that aggressive variant of any sort of deck. Argentina will be thinking, what do we want to throw away here? You've got one of the return tools already. Having a Wisp in hand can be great, especially if you're able to get uh, a Ferryman as well, for example. I think they may choose to throw away either the Wisp or the Shard here. Actually, they're just going to throw both away. And Mimic Pod is good, but Vanish, eh, I'm, I'm not so sold on as to have in your mulligan. Drawing it later on is always great, though. Yeah, I, you could argue that against a Shaman, you expect it to be a slow deck. And, and so you, maybe you have time to play the Vanish, but... It doesn't look like it's going to pay off. Uh, Joe Semi, one of the YouTubers of Team Spain, actually has a huge following on YouTube and on Twitter with several hundreds of thousand followers that enjoy his content. Uh, time to see if Evangelion and Duck have managed to push these guys or pull these guys up with the rest of them. Obviously, it helps that they've got these guys uh, over comms with them at all times, uh, but pressure is on. Let's see what Joe Semi has learned. 2 0 up already and potentially a favorable matchup for him to work with as well, going mm -hmm. up against the Quest Rogue with aggression. But there is a Hex as well, which could be important later on, um, just to try and remove any immediate threats coming through from Argentina. But there, there's a lot of talking, a lot of discussion going through from Spain as to what the optimal play is here. What would you kind of go for here, Dan? Hmm. So J Claws is okay. You don't want to overload yourself, but if you do, you can go ahead and play the Flame Tongue Totem next turn anyway. It's, it's a pretty nice two-mana play. Deckhand, if possible, you'd like to save that for after the Flame Tongue Totems come down. If you can play Deckhand with Charge and summon the patches on the other side and push all of that damage in. Um, or yeah, just, just putting down the Flame Tongue Totem nice and early. It, it does enable... Um, J Claws and Deckhand to come down next turn, pushing how much damage is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine damage, not including the Argent Squire. So 12 damage, including the Argent Squire, because of the way that you can manipulate patches and the positioning there. So Glacial Shard coming off the top for Argentina is actually really big, because otherwise it was essentially a dead turn. They could have coined Mimic Potted. Now they could go for Glacial Shard into Coin into Brewmaster if they wanted to, just to try and hold back a little bit of this damage that's uh, being put on the board by Josemi in Spain. Instead, it looks like they're just going to dagger up and take another three here. And this is exactly why Quest Rogue loses to Aggro. And, and do you know what? Now Gaiden already seems like he knows that he's in a very, very bad position here. Uh, it, it, he doesn't have anything to play. Glacial Shard, sure, but even until you've until you've completed the quest, even if you do have cards to play, you're just playing 1-1s one and then pulling them back into your hand again. You're not actually developing, and now I assume the obvious play for Spain here is Deckhand goes down, Patches get summoned, then you put down Jade Claws and push all of this damage. This is not a pretty sight for Argentina, who are staring down a possible 0-3 barrel. After winning 3-0 in their first match, now they look... Like, they are going to be, it's coming to a very quick loss as well. And I spoke about Justice earlier when we witnessed the Murloc Paladin getting destroyed by uh, Hungry Crab. There are a lot of people that will be very happy to see Quest Rogue being absolutely annihilated like this. I agree and I disagree. I agree because, yeah, it's pretty fun seeing Quest Rogue be become annihilated. So uh, often the, the first deck that becomes the best deck in the meta is one that a lot of people end up hating. Yeah. However, I am getting some post-traumatic... 
uh, experience, like feelings right now because the flame tongue deck hand patches combination is so much burst damage, so much additional burst damage, which arguably the shaman that already has lightning bolts and lava bursts and rock biter weapons and doom hammers. They don't, they don't need this. They don't need seven damage from the hand plus the damage that's already on the board with Flame Tongue Totem as well. It's just too much. Uh, sorry, I'm having a breakdown. It's, it's okay. We'll get uh, you a glass of water. It'll be okay. fine. We'll put ice in it and everything. Okay. And you'll be all ready for the next matchup, okay? Okay. okay. All right, great. Well, thank you. I mean, I think that Argentina might need some iced water as well, to be honest, because this is going to be a very tough loss to take. If they do lose, I mean, okay, they'll still be considering that out here. They do have a backstab to work with off the top that they can deal with the Flame Tongue Totem. They don't have a fan of knives, which would have been phenomenal. Yeah, in this unfortunately, situation. a lot of these decks just don't just don't run fan of knives anymore. They they've just cut removal bit by bit. Goodbye fan of knives. Goodbye eviscerate. Some even cut backstab at some point. And it's games like this where they really pun get punished as a result. Now, I guess with the overload, it means that Jade Spirit can't come down. So. Josami is actually deciding to trade off here. He doesn't want any sort of threat to come down. Those Vanishes might be able to come into play if somehow Argentina can survive, but it's looking very awkward. And judging by the reaction in the Wisp coming off the top, it looks <laughs> like Argentina are down and out. Hilariously, Jade Spirit indicates that it's not actually a purely aggressive deck. Jade Spirit is not an aggressive card. So the fact that, that Spain, Josemi, got such a strong Ooh. card, uh, uh, sorry, such a strong start with that card in the deck and other control cards, um, he got pretty lucky here. The Shadow Steps does mean that Argentina can stay alive here. They can just about <laughs> stop this uh, bombardment of damage coming through just by freeze after freeze after freeze and actually completing this quest as well. Yeah, uh, it's definitely a lot of stalling that's going on right now, leaving three damage. It's okay. Vanish is going to be important, but the problem is all of the cards on Jusemi's side of the board are, are like, what, one or two mana? And two of them have charge. So even removing the damage with Vanish isn't actually going to do... Well, it's going to do less than freezing. So. And there's more damage to the face as well. No potential for lethal here, even if you were to have any spell power on board, it's just going to be seven that can go to the face. And I guess now if you're Spain, why not just trade off these 1-1s one as well? Because you don't want them to turn into 5-5s. Five and to be honest, I think I'd rather play the Jade Spirit if I was playing in his shoes and I don't think about the Vanish. I, I can see the Vanish as a caster, so naturally I would think maybe Jade Lightning might be better, but they're going to go for the Jade Spirit and just put lots on the board. Yeah, now Gaiden was very unhappy once he saw the Jade Spirit, probably for the same reason that I just talked about there. Like, how did he get such a start when he's got these late game Jade cards in his deck? What what just happened to me? Uh, picking up Preparation does mean you can play the Vanish But even then cheaper. your decks don't, right? But yeah, it doesn't do anything. Like, Coin Vanish is just as good as Prep Vanish here. I mean, but Coin Vanish, you get the deck hand back in your hand. You've got Jade Lightning plus mm -hmm. your weapon plus the South Sea deck hand as well. So that's going to be the damage, and that is going to be 3 to 0 for Spain. They've come back after losing 3 0 in their first game in a previous week, and now they'll be tying themselves up in the group at 1 and 1, and Argentina will also fall and beat 1 and 1 as well. A phenomenal performance from Spain, and they've just blown Argentina out of the water. Just as Joe Semi picks up that last Manatai Totem as his last card. Another not aggressive card. Um, very, very nicely done by Team Spain. It has to be said, a 3-0 after their performance last time. Uh, yeah, well, they're on the board now. They are, definitely. And uh, they'll feel a little bit more... I mean, we spoke about being comfortable. Now they'll feel comfortable in the standings as well. Because if they were staring at a 0-2, and two, then suddenly they're in an awful position, just like Kazakhstan are. They need to be winning pretty much every game if they want to be able to get through those groups. So 0-2 and two would have been uh, a very sticky situation. Instead, they're 1-1 one and one and they'll be tied with Argentina. I mean, was there any kind of standout moments you, you felt throughout the series? Was it all just down to, to better deck choices from Spain to, to conquer Argentina here? I mean, it was quite brutal all it of the way through, wasn't it? It's difficult to even talk about about what went wrong for Argentina because so much did. Poor now Gaiden. Poor now Gaiden. Losing two out of the three games that he played. I mean, he stepped up to the task, at least. Yeah. When, you're, when you're, your anchor's not there, so PNC didn't turn up. He wasn't able to play today. So instead, now Gaiden said, I'll step up, I'll fill your boots, but unfortunately he has to lose two games. Perhaps there's something to be said about the ordering. Maybe Nargonin could have played first and fourth, for example, and maybe giving 
given Ildima a chance to play, but instead they'll fall three to zero. You're right though when you said that the decks were lined up very nicely for Spain. The Freeze Mage, of course, losing to the Jade Druid that could gain millions of armor. Slight exaggeration. Um, but yeah, it, it just it didn't work out well. The Paladin game was close but not close enough. Well, let's have a little chat to the boys from Spain, or one of the boys from Spain. Let's find out who it is. It's going to be Duck. Congratulations uh, for your victory. A very dominant one. I mean, did you ever think you were going to lose that series? Because after 2-0, you were pretty much in the driving seat. Well, I mean, um, after we saw their classes, um, it was pretty clear that we had an advantage because we had uh, we had picked uh, the, the classes according to what we thought they would pick. And we, it was pretty much according to what we thought we, was going to happen, right? I mean, we, we killed the Shaman into the Rogue, which we thought had a good matchup. We threw it into the Mage. Uh, it looked pretty good, uh, looking just at the picks. A strategy that worked out perfectly. What better way to win a series is there than that? Uh, Doc, you didn't actually get to play. Uh, do, you, do you have any, any feelings about that? Are you disappointed? Are you excited to play next time? Or are you just happy that your team won? I'm extremely happy. I mean, I, I was telling them earlier that I, I wish we could win 3-0 three, three and I didn't get to play than, <laughs> than drag the series long, longer, right? Uh, no, no, I, I, I'm extremely happy. I mean, after all, we play the games uh, as a group. Uh, it's only one person who, who is um, piloting the deck, but it's all of us making decisions, right? So in a way, uh, I played as much as they did. And how much research went into your preparation uh, uh, into this match as well? Did you look back at the previous week's games to find out what you thought that your opposition might be playing? I mean, sort of. I mean, we, we knew that the, they had started week one with, with Freeze Mate, so we were ex sort of expecting something like that. I mean, it was a pretty long cut, right? But, but yeah, I mean, mo mo mostly we, were, we tried to have a setup which uh, had two classes that we're apart from each other. I mean, we try to to not lose against a single class on, on each of our two heroes on, on every player. And that's pretty much what we did. And we figured they would start mage, but it was a pretty long shot, right? I mean, we had a backup plan if they didn't. Well, if you can continue that strategy through the rest of the Global Games, I'm sure you'll have a good place to be in. Thank you for joining us for an interview and congratulations again. Thank you very much. I mean, he didn't play. He didn't play. But he was able to kind of backseat drive and feel confident about his teammates. I mean, it's always good to have someone who can sit back and, and look at something from a different point of view, right? I'll be honest with you, Dan. I'm just a little bit disappointed that we never got Duck versus Snail. It's a shame we didn't have the, the amazing matchup that we want as we look at some of the highlights from the series that we have just witnessed. Of course, it was a very quick series. Argentina, they tried their best. Uh, PNC, of course, didn't play, so it meant that Nargo didn't have to play twice, and he opened things up with the Freeze Mage. But in the end, it was just really tough matchups all round. They were all favourable for Spain. Uh, yeah, they were. Again, as I said before, the Paladin one was close. I've heard arguments in both directions. Some people saying the faster deck, just because they can curve out better, mm -hmm. is favoured against the slower deck. That being said, Consecration is obviously a card that's much better the other way around. And also, Spain were able to curve out just as well as the aggro paladin, so it worked out perfectly for them. Jade Druid just slowly, steadily building up the Jade Golems and eventually gaining too much armor for the Freeze Mage to ever deal with. And even Jellion was just drawing card after card as well. Uh, getting Tyrion off the top in this situation was fantastic because the uh, Repentance was already there, but it meant that it was a 6-1 with Divine Shield they had to deal with rather than, a, well, an 8-1 Ragnaros Lightlord that could have been played, right? Uh, Sunkeeper Tarim getting played a few times from Snail. Uh, did some work, but not quite enough. It's difficult for you to really come back when you've got no cards in hand. And your opponent has two, including Ragnaros Lightlord, and a card that has Discover, the Ivory Knight, picking up an extra Discover at the end of that little section there before we cut to the next part. Stonehill Defender. Just so much value compared to an empty hand. Um, it's pretty difficult to be in the aggro deck in that scenario. Now, I, I asked Duck slightly, and I asked him about his research going into to this matchup. Of course, as weeks go on, and there'll be more matches to research, how important is it going to be 
for their preparation to be looking at what people have been playing, what kind of decks they've been favoring? Do you think that's going to be something that's going to play a key factor in this tournament? It's something which is going to become more and more important as time goes on and as N'Goro meta becomes more stable. First few weeks, things are changing. Like, decks that, that seem great in week one seem terrible by week five a lot of the time. But once we get really in, once the meta begins to become solved, people are going to start favoring similar decks. And that's where I think research will become most important because players will become a little bit more consistent. Well, there's the updated table of Group C. Russia still at the top with New Zealand, but Argentina and Spain are both one and one now after that previous game. Austria and Australia still sat at the bottom. The two A's at zero and one. They need to try and turn their group stage around if they are going to do anything big in these global games. I mean, is that how you saw the group kind of panning out? Were, were they the teams you'd be expecting to see at the top? <sighs> Yeah, it's it's very, very hard to assess because yeah. so many of these players are unknowns. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're worse at the Hearthstone. Some people in some countries just haven't had their chance for a big break yet. I'm happy to see Spain get a win in because I think a lot of people have been putting that team down because people have been saying, oh, they're just, they're just YouTubers and a couple of pro players. But, you know, if these guys are willing to work hard and get themselves through, I think they've got a great chance. Well, Spain take the victory 3-0 to zero against Argentina. But now we'll move on to match number three, which is going to be Finland versus Chile. So we'll be back very shortly for that exciting matchup. We're almost there. Quiet down, everyone. This is not like any of our previous expeditions. This will be far more ambitious. We're stepping into a land of primordial wonder. Infused with astonishing elemental energies. Life here holds very unusual properties. So don't touch anything. And while you may be excited to see the local fauna, you might want to make sure they don't see you. Because their powers of adaptation are devastating. Make no mistake, we will be tested at every turn. But if we stay on our guard, we might just survive. Now then, are you ready? Then let's journey into Ongoro Crater. 